When I encounter a nonspecific lung nodule as a chest radiologist, there are a set of imaging features I pay attention to that will influence my suspicion of whether that lung nodule is malignant or not. These are the imaging features, and I'd like to walk you through each one, starting with the most obvious feature, size. It's practically axiomatic that the larger a lung nodule, the more suspicious will be that it's malignant. But how much more suspicious should we be? And what does the evidence that supports this actually look like? For patients with no cancer history, the studies on this slide are a good place to start. Swenson looked at lung nozzles of up to seven millimeters in patients 50 years of age and older with a smoking history of at least 20 pack years and observed a malignancy rate of 0.1%. For nodules up to 10 millimeters, Diedrich observed a malignancy rate of 0.1 to 2.7% and Benjamin observed a malignancy rate of 1%. Henschke did her analysis in two buckets, reporting a malignancy rate of 0% in lung nodules under 5 millimeters and 6% in lung nozzles between 5 millimeters and 9 millimeters. Zerhuni looked at things at the other end of the size spectrum and reported a malignancy rate of 94% in lung masses over 3 centimeters. Lung nodule size in and of itself, however, is not a perfect discriminator for malignancy. Erasmus looked at a large pool of lung nodules and observed that 20% of benign lung nodules were over two centimeters in size, while 15% of malignant lung nodules were under one centimeter. There's also this large gap between 10 millimeters and 30 millimeters, where the risk of malignancy is heavily influenced by factors besides size like clinical presentation and setting. That's why we handle nonspecific lung nodules between one and three centimeters the way that we described in our how to approach nonspecific lung nodules in masses essentials talk. Our suspicion that any lung nodule may be malignant is also heavily influenced by whether a patient has a known malignancy. These three studies are good to look at. Although there's an element of selection bias here since we're looking at biopsy lung nodules, the message is pretty clear. In FNAs of subcentimeter lung nodules in patients with a known malignancy, Wallace reported a 68% rate of malignancy, compared to rates hovering around 1% in patients with no known malignancy that we looked at a few slides ago. The TLDR is that the possibility a nonspecific lung nodule is malignant is dramatically higher if your patient has a known malignancy. The lung nodule follow-up schedules in the Fleischner Society guidelines and Lung RADS guidelines are generally based on the assumption that the patient does not have a known primary, which means we should avoid using them in patients with known primaries for which pretest probabilities for malignancy may be an order of magnitude different. Since size is not a perfect discriminator of malignancy, chest radiologists rely on other imaging features too, such as air bronchograms within the lung nodule. The little airways inside a lung nodule are usually occluded in invasive malignancies. Seeing an air bronchogram inside a lung nodule suggests the etiology of the lung nodule is less aggressive and more likely something like infection or non-infectious inflammation. There are two exceptions to this rule, however, with non-invasive adenocarcinoma and pulmonary lymphoma. In these two malignancies, the disruption of the lung anatomy is less aggressive than in other cancers, and air bronchograms can occur. Cavitation. Cavitation can have significant implications with regards to patient complications and public health, but it's not a fantastic discriminator for malignancy. Although 15% of lung cancers cavitate, cavitation can happen in many benign disorders too. While cavitation is not a great differentiator, do pay attention to the wall of the cavity. Smooth, thin walls tend to suggest a benign etiology, while thick walls or irregular walls should substantially raise your suspicion for malignancy. Pseudocavitation is a different feature. Pseudocavitation generally occurs in subsolid lung nodules caused by either tiny ear bronchograms or tiny areas of non-opacified lung parenchyma that can mimic 
the look of tiny sub-centimeter foci of cavitation. This imaging feature, when you see it in the subsolid lung nozzle, is suggestive for non-invasive adenocarcinoma. The internal heterogeneity of a lung nozzle or mass is not an ideal discriminator for malignancy, but another feature that can nudge our suspicion. While approximately half of benign nodules are heterogeneous and the other half homogeneous, malignant nodules are much more often internally heterogeneous. The overall density of a lung nodule can influence our suspicion of malignancy too, particularly when the nodule is subsolid. Although the majority of lung nodules and masses in Henschke's analysis of baseline lung cancer screening CTs were solid, much higher malignancy rates were observed in part solid and ground glass lung nodules as a group than in solid lung nodules. Macroscopic fat, as we discussed in our How to Approach Specific Lung Nodules and Masses Essentials talk, is a pathognomonic feature of hamartomas and therefore a strong indicator of benignity. The impact of calcification on our suspicion for malignancy requires some nuance. Since some calcifications are pathognomonic for benignity in the absence of osteosarcoma, while other calcification patterns are not. This isn't a surprise when you consider that a third of carcinoid tumors and 13% of primary lung cancers exhibit calcification. Also, lung cancers have been known to engulf small calcified granulomas from time to time. So be familiar with the four benign lung nodule calcification patterns. Uniform diffuse calcification of the entire lung nodule. Uniform calcification in the center of a lung nodule. Laminated or target-like calcification in a nodule and popcorn-like chunky calcifications of uniform density. Be on guard when you encounter other calcification patterns, like amorphous calcification, uh, calcification patterns, where the density of calcification is not uniform and varies. Be wary of fine stippled calcifications, or if a small number of calcifications are distributed very eccentrically in the nodule. Although nodules with these calcification patterns may still sometimes end up being benign, malignant nodules can look and exhibit these calcification patterns too. The shape of a lung nodule will influence a chest radiologist's suspicion for malignancy. We generally feel good about polygonal and triangular nodules since these are usually benign. Our suspicion for malignancy is also lower with flat or discoid nodules too, since small sites of fibrosis and small pulmonary lymph nodes tend to have this shape. Remember to check the sagittal and coronal MPRs when you evaluate lung nodules, since sometimes the lung nodule's flat morphology may not be obvious if you're only looking at the axial CT images. Lung nodule margins are important to assess. Spiculated margins are extremely suspicious for malignancy. I'm also relatively suspicious with lobulated margins too. Be careful to dis carefully distinguish speculated margins from irregular margins, however, as irregular margins are not a good discriminator for malignancy. Smooth margins are also a bit of a coin flip too. While most smooth margin nodules as a group are benign, most metastatic lung nodules when they occur have smooth margins. Here's some imaging examples of the four types of lung margins. The lung mass in the upper left image has speculated margins. It happens to be a rare case where the diagnosis actually turned out to be benign. The lung nodule in the upper right image has lobulated margins. This also happens to be a less common case when the diagnosis ended up being benign too. The lung nodule in the lower left image has irregular margins and was a lung adenocarcinoma and the lung nodule in the lower right image has smooth margins and was a renal cell carcinoma metastasis. Another feature chest radiologists pay attention to is clustering. Clusters of small lung nodules within a segment or subsegment of lung are usually benign, like in these two examples of pulmonary sarcoidosis. We pay close attention to the growth rate of a lung nodule if there are prior studies to compare to. With benign processes, Nodules either grow very fast with volume doubling times under a month in cases of infection or active inflammation, or they grow very slow with volume doubling times in excess of 400 days. 
We become suspicious when lung nodules grow at a rate in between this range, as most malignant nodules exhibit volume doubling times between 30 and 400 days. Minimally invasive lung adocarcinoma that present as subsolid lung nodules are an exception to these rules, however, as they tend to have much longer volume doubling times, often over 400 days. Finally, we pay attention to the location of a lung nodule. Lung nodules, all other features being the same, have a higher probability of malignancy when discovered in an upper lobe. On the other hand, benign pulmonary lymph nodes commonly exist along the pleura, along the peripheral lung margin, or along a fissure. In patients without a history of malignancy, lung nodules in locations along the lung margins and fissures are usually benign. These are the imaging features that chest radiologists use, not in isolation, but in aggregate when we assess lung nodules. And we do this with the context of the patient's history and presentation. The ability to determine our level of suspicion using these features is extremely valuable for lung nodules in the one to three centimeter range and in patients who don't have a history of cancer but meet exclusion criteria for the Fleischner or Lungrads guidelines.